okay we are recording now let me share my slides here okay all right so hopefully you you guys are able to see my slides now let me know if you are not okay so let's go ahead and get started with uh, lecture 8 so we will be moving on to uh, chapter 4 of the textbook so we'll be dealing with sections 4.1 4.2 and 4.3 of the text today so our problem has changed right so earlier the, the first thing that we started was uh, ax equals b and we are trying to look for solutions uh, of x that uh, satisfy that uh, set of um, the system of linear equations and then we went to finding the solutions by evaluating the inverse of the matrix where x is a inverse times b um, and then we looked at uh, different subspaces uh, in the euclidean space r to the n subspace null space range row space column space and all those all those things and now we are going to in chapter 4 move on to uh, in to talk about ax equals lambda x so what we have here is a matrix a and if you multiply that matrix with a column vector of unknowns, can you find uh, another column vector of unknowns, the same one, but it is now scaled by lambda. And if there is an X that satisfies that, it would be called the eigenvector of A, and that corresponding lambda is going to be called the eigenvalue. And we'll talk about that. And then we'll also talk about determinants and when we do row operations to reduce the matrix, what happens to the determinants because of that? So we'll be talking about that today. Let's start off with uh, an example problem here and we are dealing with uh, the uh, calculation of uh, probability of rain tomorrow, right? So we have an example over here uh, where the weather on one day is related to the weather on the following day. Uh, and we have a few statements to uh, dictate this problem. If it rains today, then the probability of rain tomorrow is half. And similarly, if it rains today, the probability of no rain tomorrow is half, right? So we need to get half and half to be a one. So if it rains today, there is half and half chance that it'll rain uh, tomorrow. Next, if there's no rain today, then rain tomorrow probability is one quarter. And if there's no rain today, then the probability of no rain tomorrow is three fourths, right? So this is our problem. Essentially, we are trying to predict whether it will rain tomorrow or not based on what we observe today. So this is an example problem and we are going to translate these statements into a transition matrix and then we'll try to solve uh, for the probability of rain for tomorrow in terms of probability of rains on the previous day. So let's try to see what is the long term probability of rain. We essentially want to determine the probability of rain or probability of no rain for tomorrow. What we are going to get are two linear equations. So you can get the probability of rain for tomorrow. Uh, let me, this is for both, right? So all of this is for tomorrow. And all of these are based on today. So probability of rain for tomorrow is going to be half times the probability that it rained today, plus one quarter that the probability of no rain today. And then similarly, we can write this uh, similar equation for probability of no rain for tomorrow is going to be half times the that probability of rain today plus three quarters multiplied by probability that it didn't rain uh, today, right? So this is essentially based on these four statements over here. Now, what we observe over here is if you treat uh, PR and PNR as unknowns, let me just move it over here. If you treat uh, probability of rain and probability of no rain as unknowns, you can translate this system of linear equations into a matrix form. So on the left, you have this matrix, a square matrix, and we are calling that A uh, with the coefficients of the unknowns. You are multiplying that with X, the vector of unknowns, and on the right side, what you get is the vector of unknowns. So you have a, a problem like A X equals X, right? We have trans translated these uh, two linear equations uh, into a matrix form. Now, how are we going to solve this? So what we can do is uh, a simple trick here, which is we will try to multiply the right hand side with an identity matrix. 
and we know we can do this we can we can we, ha we have the a from before we have the vector of unknowns from before and we are simply multiplying the identity matrix here so this is i2 and everything else is the same right so we have the a from before we have the x from before we have x from before we can without uh, any issues we can multiply a vector with an identity without changing its value so we are doing that we are multiplying with an identity over there now once we do that we can bring all the things that are on the right hand side to the left hand side and factor out the vector x how is that going to look like when you bring this guy on the left hand side the the first row first element and the second row second element is going to get subtracted by ones so you see them here and here and the other two are not going to get subtracted because they're just subtracting a zero from there. X remains as is. And on the right hand side, because you've got everything on to the left, you on the right hand side, you're left with nothing but a zero vector. So we are trying to solve this, right? In, we are trying to solve this particular equation. So what is this? This is AX equals zero problem, right? So we are looking at the null space of uh, A in this case. So if you simplify this a little bit further, what you get is uh, a new matrix over here, which is simply, what is this? This is, I can write this guy as A minus uh, I. In this case, it is I2, but in general, it is going to be I. And then over here, you have X, and on over here, you have zero. So you when you, when you try to solve this, you have a minus i over here, the vector of unknowns over here, and the zero vector over here. Now you're looking at this, you can try to find the solutions of this problem. So to find the solutions, let me just show you how, how to do that. Uh, first, what we notice is, if we did any sort of uh, row operations, uh, the, the one of the rows would cancel out, right? The, the, the second row is essentially, multiply the first row with a negative one, you get the second row which essentially means they are not linearly independent. They are, in fact, linearly dependent. So what we are going to have is uh, many solutions, right? So I can translate this uh, and just write one equation. So one equation will be negative half uh, probability of rain uh, plus one fourth probability of no rain equals zero, right? Uh, and if you assume that the probability of rain uh, is some uh, arbitrary value t, then you can find the corresponding probability of no rain, which is negative half t plus one fourth probability of no rain uh, equals zero, which implies that probability of no rain is simply going to be 2t, right? Now, you got probability of rain as t, probability of no rain as 2t, but you also know that these are probabilities and they should add up to one. So t plus 2t should give you one. Uh, and the only way to do that if, is if uh, t is one third. So that will give you the solution, which is probability of rain is one third and probability of no rain, long-term probability of no rain is two third, right? So that will be the solution. So you've got this problem and you have, you have, you have uh, translated that into a, 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 a a homogeneous set of equations um, and then try to solve it. So I've got an X that satisfies these uh, linear equations, which were obtained from those four statements. Now let's take a look at uh, interpreting this solution as an eigenvector. So we are talking about AX equals lambda X, right? We are trying to interpret that x, but whether it satisfies that equation or not. So we have our a from before, those were the coefficients of all those probabilities. x was the vector of unknowns with pr and pnr. And what we did was we solved the linear system of equations, which was ax equals x. Going back uh, right here, this is ax equals x. That's what we tried to solve. Coming back, right. So ax equals x, and if there is a x that satisfies this, then it would be called the eigenvector. So if you have A as a square matrix, the vector x is an eigenvector of matrix A, 
and the scale, there, if there is a, in our case, the scalar was just a one, but if there is in general a scalar lambda, uh, that's going to be called the eigenvalue. And we are looking for solutions for AX equals lambda X, right? So that vector X should satisfy this with some scalar lambda. And in this case, lambda will be called the eigenvalue and X, if it satisfies this equation will be called the eigenvector. So in our weather example, the probability of uh, rain and no rain, the vector of unknowns X had one solution, which was one third and two third. That is going to be an eigenvector of A with lambda equals one. So our, our eigenvalue for A was one and the eigenvector of A was one third and two third, right? So you can, you can, you can check that by saying, all right, if I took A and if I multiplied by X over here, will I get the same X or not, right? And in this case, it's going to be one X. So lambda is one and it satisfies so that X is going to be our eigenvector of A. Let's try to look at some examples of eigenvectors. Uh, we have some arbitrary two by two matrix in A. We have an unknown uh, X here and we are trying to find the eigenvector for this. So uh, if you did A X, Question is, do you get some scaled version of X or not? Um, and if you do, then X is going to be your eigenvector. And that scaling that happened would be your eigenvalue. So A is given to us, our vector is given, let's check whether it's an eigenvector or not, uh, by multiplying A X. So we have A from before, we have taken X from before, you multiply them, you get four and a two, which is essentially a scaled version of X. Right. So if you treat X as a vector, it is just increasing that length, doubling that length of that vector and you get a X. So it's like in the range of a, right? A X is going to give you the range of uh, a in the range of a, do you have a vector in the same direction as X? It could be uh, pointing in a different direction, right? It could be pointing in the opposite direction. So for example, if Lambda is negative, then you have that, uh, right hand side vector 2x going the other way, but double the length. Uh, so you're looking for vectors that are in the range of A that are scaled versions of X. So in this case, AX gave you 2x. So you can say that X is an eigenvector with the eigenvalue 2. And similarly, there are other eigenvectors uh, for A. So let's take a look at another, the second example here. We are considering the same matrix A and now we have some Y, a vector with one and two as the elements. Let us check whether it's an eigenvector or not and what would be the eigenvalue for A if Y is the eigenvector. You compute AY. If you look at AY, you've got A from before, Y uh, is the eigenvector over here. You're checking for that, which will essentially give you negative one and negative two, which is essentially negative one times Y, right? So yes, Y is an eigenvector with lambda or eigenvalue to be a negative one. So in this case for A, you got uh, two different eigenvectors with their own eigenvalues. Now we are going to try to do, to solve this uh, for any general case, right? So finding eigenvectors, how do you do this? An eigenvector X is simply going to satisfy this equation. AX should equal Lambda X. So that would be X would qualify as an eigenvector of A for some scalar value, eigenvalue Lambda. Or what you can equivalently write it as is this. AX equals Lambda X. I can multiply the right hand side with an identity without any change of value. So I've got AX, I've pulled the scalar up front I've got the identity matrix over here with the same X. Now, if I bring this term to the left hand side, I can factor out the vector X and write it as matrix A minus scalar lambda multiplied by identity. And of course, this identity matrix has to have the same size as A. If you multiply this with vector X, you should get the zero vector, right? So now we are looking at what are the X's that are in the null space of A minus lambda I. 
right? And the solutions to this homogeneous set of equations. We have changed the problem to a minus lambda i here. So x essentially is going to be the null space of a minus lambda i. Lambda is a scalar uh, for some eigenvalue lambda. Uh, so we say lambda is an eigenvalue of a if and only if a minus lambda i is singular, right? So that particular matrix has to be uh, invertible. Um, we have looked at singular and non-singular matrices before, right? We want that determinant to be equal to zero. If that determinant is zero, then you say it's uh, singular and the corresponding lambda you get for that would qualify as a eigenvalue of that matrix A. So it boils down to finding out the determinant of A minus lambda I. So let's take a look at uh, the property that we have seen before, which is for a two by two matrix here, A has some four elements, P, Q, R, and S. It is considered to be singular if and only if the determinant of A is zero, right? So the determinant of A here uh, is going to be what? And you can say determinant of A is P, S minus Q, R, and that has to go to zero, right? And if it does, then you can call that a singular uh, matrix determinant has to go to zero. But we are not really after determinant of A, we are actually looking for A minus lambda I, right? Because we are looking for this guy uh, to, to find the null space of A minus lambda I. So for A minus lambda I, you're scaling uh, only the diagonal elements by lambda. So the only things that get subtracted are first row first element P and the second row second element S. So you get S P minus lambda, Q remains as is, R remains as is, and you get S minus lambda. Now the determinant of this should go to zero and that's how you would find the corresponding eigenvalues. So the eigenvalue lambda of A is going to be, uh, the A minus lambda I should be singular. So the determinant of this guy, which is product of those two elements minus the product of those two elements. So you got the characteristic polynomial here, which is P minus lambda multiplied by S minus lambda minus q times r should go to zero. So it will give you a quadratic in uh, lambda, which are, we are going to call characteristic polynomial. So you can have um, real roots, you can have complex roots, uh, you can have repeated roots uh, you, you, because it's a quadratic. And if you are able to find that lambda, then you know it's going to be an eigenvalue. So let's try to do an example over here. We'll use that same strategy. So we have laid that strategy out over here. So we have lambda, which is an eigenvalue of A, some A, which is two by two, which has some elements P, Q, R, and S, uh, if and only if the determinant of A minus lambda I goes to a zero, right? So let's try to find uh, the uh, eigenvalues and using each eigenvalue, we can find the eigenvectors that correspond to that. So let's take an example of A matrix here, which is two by two. 4, 5, negative 1, and negative 2, then determinant of A minus lambda I is simply going to be the determinant where each element is 4 minus lambda here, negative 2 minus negative lambda here because the identity only changes the diagonal elements. Everything else is getting subtracted by 0, so no change there, 5 and negative 1. Now you find the determinant of this guy is going to be 4 minus lambda times negative 2 minus negative lambda minus 5. Uh, minus of minus five, so plus five. That gives you a quadratic in lambda. Solve it. When you solve this quadratic, you are going to get the roots to be three and a negative one. So the, you get two eigenvalues in this case. These are distinct real roots. So we, we given a matrix, that is how you would calculate the eigenvalues. So now essentially what you know is, if you took A and you multiplied it with some vector X, you would get a scaled version of that x. That scaling for this particular a can be three or it can be negative one. So you'll have two solutions here. So let's try to check, let's try to take a look at uh, lambda equals three. What would be that x that would satisfy? And let's take lambda equals negative one and then check with what, what eigenvector we get for a when lambda is negative one. So finding the eigenvectors. So we have already found the eigenvalues as three and negative one. Let's take the first case here, eigenvalue of three. So eigenvalue of three 
the eigenvector would be in the null space of a minus lambda i. So we look at a minus lambda i, we are trying to look for the uh, null space of a minus lambda i. Lambda we have used as 3 here, so we have a minus 3 times i, which is going to give you uh, a minus 3 times i. And you solve this, you get the a minus lambda i matrix to be 1, 5, negative 1, and negative 5. And again, uh, you can see that row 2 is essentially row 1 multiplied by negative 1, right? So this, these are linearly dependent uh, rows. So you're not going to get a unique solution. You're going to get uh, infinitely many solutions here. Um, and you can, you can uh, find that out, right? So you can say, um, if I take this particular a minus lambda i multiplied by x, what gives me zero, right? So you can say 1, 5, negative 1, negative 5. If you multiply with some x1, x2, it should give me, the, in, it should be in the null space, so it should give me zero. So what would be that x1 and x2? Well, using both the rows is not going to give you anything because the second row is dependent on the first row or vice versa. Or you can just take one of them, right? So if you take the equation that corresponds to uh, the first row here, you get x1 uh, plus 5x2 should equal 0. And now what I can do is I can assume uh, some, uh, let's say, I will assume that x2, uh, x2 is a negative t, just an assumption here. You could have picked x1 as a t as well. Uh, you. No matter what you do, you get infinitely many solutions. If you plug x2 equals negative t, what you get for x1 is uh, 5t. So you can write that as the solution set here, which is t multiplied by 5 and negative 1 based on this. So these are going to be your eigenvectors. Any vector that you that is a scaled version, any scaling, right? 1, 2, 3, any, any one. Any scaling of this vector here, uh, 5 and negative 1, will qualify as an eigenvector with the eigenvalue 3, right? So all of these are going to satisfy a x equals lambda x. So you can pick any scaled version of this for x with lambda equals 3, it will satisfy. And you can check this quickly. Let's check it for, uh, let's just assume t is 1, right? So if you assume t is 1, you are saying x is simply this, right? So if you look at ax, a is the given matrix. Uh, x is your eigenvector, 5 minus 1. And if you do the matrix multiplication, you get 15 and negative 3, which is simply 3 times the eigenvector. So the eigenvector value has matched the eigenvector has matched as well, right? So that is essentially checking that x is in fact the solution to this with lambda equals three, right? So any scaled version of five minus one is your eigenvector here. And you have many eigenvectors for this uh, eigenvalue. How about the other eigenvalue of lambda equals negative one? You are, we are going to do the same thing. We are going to find the null space of a minus lambda i. So a minus lambda i, in this case, lambda is negative one. So that becomes a plus i. a is the matrix under consideration plus i. So you get five, five, negative one, negative one. And again, you have both these rows. Uh, they are not linearly independent. They are dependent because you can get the second row by simply multiplying uh, the first row by negative one and dividing it by five. You get the second row. So we, we would do the same thing. We would look at only one of them, pick an arbitrary value for one unknown, and you would get another system of uh, solutions, another solution set here, which is some t multiplied by the vector one negative one would qualify as an eigenvector with an eigenvalue of negative one for the matrix A. And you can check this, plug in the A matrix, use t as one and uh, choose the x over here, and check whether it gives you back the same x, uh, ne well, negative x, right? Because lambda is negative one. Uh, so a times one and negative one would give you negative one and one. You can check that with a as this, and it will give you negative one times the same eigenvector here. So both lambda equals three and lambda equals negative one, you were able to find the corresponding eigenvectors. 
In this case, there are uh, many eigenvectors for each choice of eigenvalue. So for a two by two case, that would be how you go about finding the eigenvectors or eigenvalues uh, for a two by two matrix. Next, we are going to look at uh, determinants of three by three matrices, uh, but in slightly different manner. Uh, in the previous classes, we uh, looked at it uh, in terms of doing the row operations. You start off with A augmented matrix with A and identity, and then you would try to do row operations in such a way that you get the identity matrix instead of A, and whatever is remaining on the right side for identity would be the inverse of that uh, matrix A. We can do all of the same things, but with a uh, slightly easier manner by using cofactor expansion. So let's take a look at that. Uh, we have previously seen uh, in the previous half of the, the course uh, that the determinants of three by three matrices is simply the curl of a vector field, right? So if you uh, consider A as your square matrix with these values, there's a three by three matrix, and these values are A11, A12, A13, that's your first row, A21, A22, A23, second row, A31, A32, A33, third row, right? Three by three. Then the determinant of this three by three matrix, which is written as determinant of all these three by three values, nine values, is simply an expansion. Um, and I'm just showing you the expansion with respect to row one here. You could use any row, any, any column, but right now I'm cho choosing to uh, pick the first row. So what you do is determinant of this can be found by taking this value here and multiplying, with, multiplying it with the minor that corresponds to that. So the way you get the minor is uh, you sim simply eliminate that and eliminate that and whatever remains becomes your minor for that A11. And similarly, you do the same thing, right? So you got A1 and you are expanding uh, for uh, the expansion is being done with respect to row one. So you're done with A11 and you would do the same thing with A12 and A13. So you A12, you got it over here and the minor that corresponds to that would be remove this row, uh, this column, the, remove that uh, row, whatever remains, which is A21, A23, A31, A33, determinant of that will give you your second uh, co uh, minor. And similarly, you have A13, multiplied by the determinant of the minor, which is, uh, in this case, you eliminate this and this, you get that, which is over here. So in the determinant of two by two matrices is pretty easy to find out, right? So you just multiply A22, A23 minus A32, A23, you get the determinant of that matrix and so on. The only thing that sort of you have to be careful about is the sign change uh, when the, so sign, changes when row number plus column number is odd, right? So when you did A11, with respect to A11, you add the row in the column, it is one plus one, two, right? So the sign doesn't change there. However, when you did A12, the row number and the column number gave you an odd number, which is three, so you get a minus one there. So essentially what you're doing is you're multiplying this with, uh, the way you're getting this is minus one raised to i plus j, uh, i plus j, where i is the row number and j is the column number. Uh, that's why you get the minus one. So we'll write this again. Uh, when we when we develop a general model, we will include that negative one raised to i, pl I, I plus j. So we, we need to be sort of aware of that. Um, now, when we, so we have a determinant of the minor and we'll formally define minor in just a bit. We have determinant of these minors uh, with the negative sign, it becomes the cofactors. So all you have is A11 cofactor uh, A12. Uh, A13 multiplied by the cofactor A13 and so on. Again, we'll formally uh, talk about that in just a bit. So. All you're doing is to, de to find the determinant of A, you're building up uh, three sub matrices, which are minors, uh, and we are finding the determinants of them, multiplying them by the uh, row or the column elements with respect to which we are doing the expansion, 
uh, but we are also keeping this uh, uh, keeping a mind uh, keeping track of the sign changes that's how you would do it for three by three matrices let's do an example here to to just uh, look at how it would work with uh, actual numbers so determinant of a i've got uh, the the a matrix plugged in already over here and i'm trying to find the determinant of that uh, i can use any row or any column to do the expansion let it let me choose row one uh, later i'll prove that you could you could pick an any so this one will be uh, the first element here multiplied by the determinant of the minor right so for the first element one your minor will give you this so this will be one minus one zero and one and for the second element here, let me just erase this off. And then for the second element, what do you have? Negative three with what? Uh, this and this. So you got negative three determinant of the minor. In this case, minor is this guy. And then the last one, two times, it would be the minor four, one, negative two, zero, right? So this, now you can simplify uh, one times uh, one, that's it, minus three times uh, four minus two, and then I have two times, uh, let's see, two. So you got one uh, minus six plus four, uh, you've got negative one. Questions about how do you find <clears throat> determinant of a three by three matrix. In this case, I, I did the expansion with respect to row one. So with this, um, I also said that you could have picked any row, any column. Um, so what I'm hoping is that you would look for expanding with a row or the column which has the most number of zeros, right? So if you have the most number of zeros, so if suppose this was a zero, this was a zero, then these two would cancel out immediately, right? So if you did some row reductions, then you would have a matrix that would have more zeros in a particular row, and you could use that to make your determinant calculation much, much faster. And we'll talk about the row reductions. Uh, we have three of them, right? So you can interchange rows, You the, the elementary row operations, three of them. One, you can interchange rows and we'll keep track of what happens to the determinant of a matrix when you interchange rows. And we'll keep track of what happens to the determinant of a matrix when you scale a particular row. Or the third option, which is uh, what happens to a determinant of a matrix when you uh, add a multiple of one row to the other row, to any uh, another row. Uh, let's see, no questions so far. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So let's formally talk about the minors, right? So those sub matrices that we got when we expanded with respect to row one, the two by two sub matrices that we got, those are considered to be the minors of a matrix. So we found the determinant of a three by three matrix by examining the determinants of a two by two uh, sub matrices. So what you can think of is two by two sub matrix is what remains when one row and one column of the original matrix are deleted, right? So that's what we did. So we, for A11, this guy, we simply deleted that, we deleted that, whatever remained was my minor. And we, I went for finding the determinant of that minor, but this would be the minor. Uh, so if I'm, con uh, if I'm, if I'm calling this guy, say A11, then what I would call this guy is minor, cap M, one, one, right? So minor, when one, the first row and the first column of the original matrix is deleted. So definition of the minor, if you have A as your N by N matrix, the matrix that remains after deleting a ith row and the Jth column of A is the I comma J minor matrix, which we are simply going to denote as cap M with the subscript I and J. So I comma J minor of determinant A, and if you are trying to go for the determinant of that minor, you are essentially finding the determinant of that minor, right? So for example, over here, uh, if I do another one, this was what? All of this, all 
all of this was simply determinant of m cap m the subscript is we got this particular minor by deleting uh, first row second column right let's go back so if a is a matrix over here then the minor uh, one one would be what remove the first row remove the first column whatever remains is going to be the minor there and similarly m23 you are removing the uh, second row and the third column in the original matrix let's try to do this one so for m23 remove the second row and remove the third column whatever you you you, you have remaining you have one three negative two and zero that is what is your minor so minors did the determinant of the minors along with the sign will help you with the uh, finding the determinants of larger matrices uh, because they will be cofactors and all you would have to do is take a particular row or column and multiply with their corresponding cofactors and, and you have the determinant so those are the minors and we are not looking after the minors we are looking for the determinant of the minors uh, when we go for the determinant of three by three matrices so what we have is we can express the determinant of the three by three matrix using the minors so determinant of the original matrix a it, and we over here we are doing the uh, expansion with respect to row one a11 determinant of m11 minus a12 determinant of that corresponding minor plus a13 multiplied by determinant of that corresponding minor now if you combine this if you combine the determinant of the minor along with the sign you that's how you uh, define a cofactor um, and we have stated this before the sign alternates as we mo move along the first row so it has to do with the addition of the row number and the column number if it is odd then you have a negative sign which is essentially tying to this particular term here so let's see how do you define a cofactor cofactor would be the signed determinant of a minor that's a cofactor uh, so let a be an n by n matrix the the i comma j cofactor of a is simply the signed determinant of the minor i comma j so with the for cofactors we are going to use cap a sub ij simply going to be signed this is taking care of the sign and this is going to be your determinant of minor so your cofactors are going to be signed determinant of minors that you are after so if you did the cofactor expansion with respect to row one you would get a11 multiplied by cap a11 plus a12 multiplied by cap a12 and a13 multiplied by cap a13 now you don't have to worry about the sign because you already took care of that within the cofactor so this is called the cofactor expansion corresponding to the first row of a you could also do it with respect to the second row of a how would the second row of a look like well you would say uh, determinant of a equals a21 a21 plus a22 a22 plus a23 a23 right so the elements have changed and you're trying to find the corresponding cofactors and that would give you the same determinant exactly the same um, and in fact you can do it for any row any column you could do the expansion all right question so far so we have introduced the terminology of cofactor minor um, and we have we were able to find um, determinants of two by two and de determinants of three by three uh, but you know if you can find determinant of two three by three by going by finding determinants of certain two by two sub matrices then you can actually go for four by four right when you start going for four by four then you are looking for cofactors that are going to have three by threes and you can break it down into two by twos and then find the answer so you can grow the size of these square matrices uh, because you already know how to break it down in cofactors 
So your cofactors will be one size less, right? So if you're looking for three by threes, you got cofactors that were uh, corresponding to two by two sub matrices. When you go for four by four, these cofactors co will be three by threes and we already know how to deal with the three by threes, break it down into two by twos and so on. And we'll do some examples uh, there as well. Now, the cofactor expansion doesn't change if you do it with respect to any row or any column. So that's the theorem uh, and we'll try to validate that uh, by expanding it with respect to row three and in the second one we'll take the same matrix and expand it do the cofactor expansion with respect to column two and let's see whether we get the the same answer or not so the determinant of a three by three matrix can be calculated by using a cofactor expansion about any row or column of a so you can do that expansion with respect to any row any column uh, let's do the cofactor expansion uh, in this case, my A is that matrix and I'm trying to find the determinant of that three by three matrix. And we'll do this expansion using uh, row three. And essentially, why are we picking row three? Because there is a zero in there, right? So if you have a zero in there, the second term is going to disappear, right? So you're trying to exploit rows or columns which are going to have uh, more zeros, right? Uh, in fact, if you have a particular row or a column with all zeros, right away you know that the determinant of that matrix is going to be zero, right? So if you if you have a situation where a particular row is um, zeros or any column is zeros, all zeros, uh, right away you know the determinant is zero. Uh, let's try to do this example here. Determinant of this guy. How do you do that? Uh, this re this is with respect to row three. So if this is with respect to row three, you take the element. Then you take the sign, the sign is going to be what? Negative one, you would raise it to the row number and the column number. What is the row number and column number for this guy? Three and one. So you would raise it to four in that case. And then you have the determinant of the minor for this. Minor is right there. Determinant of the minor, you are writing it that way. So you've got the value, the element in the original matrix. You have taken care of the sign and you have taken care of the determinant of the minor. For this you don't have to worry about this guy because it's going to be zero times something it's going to be zero don't have to worry about that next last one is this guy so you've got one multiplied by negative one raised to the row number plus column number in this case it's a three by three element so three plus three there and then determinant of the minor the de minor is for this guy is going to be what this so you plug in there and find the determinant uh, so you've got negative two multiplied by just one and then over here, you can find the determinant as negative three, negative two, that'll give you negative five. And then similarly, you have uh, negative 11 for this guy. Do the When you complete the math, you get the determinant of this matrix as negative one. Now, if you did the same calculation, but you expanded using column two, and again, we are trying to exploit that that particular element, the third row, second column element in A uh, is a zero, right? So we're doing the expansion using this. What do you have? Uh, let's try to see if you're expanding with respect to this column you are going to get three times the uh, co um, a determinant of the matrix so you've got three here if you eliminate this and this you've got these elements that go into your uh, minor let me just point that out uh, because of this three you've got that three and then the uh, corresponding um, the corresponding, uh, let me use a different color here. Maybe I use yellow. So the corresponding minor is highlighted in yellow that goes over here. Right. Uh, so you got negative three and you obviously have to take care of the sign. In this case, it is first row, second column. So one plus two, um, and then determinant over there. And similarly, you do this for this guy. You've got one, Take care of the sign this is going to be second row second column so an even multiple of negative one and then you've got the minor there so if you eliminate this row this column you've got one two negative two one those are appearing over here uh, simplify you get the same answer negative one so this sort of quickly validates that our theorem here uh, which is you can do that cofactor expansion with respect to any row or any column next Cofactor expansion uh, along 
different rows, uh, any row, any column. We'll take a look at row I in general or column J in general. So what you're looking for, the general formula for this expansion is what? The determinant of the matrix, we know that it is going to be the elements A, I, J multiplied by the cofactors, cap A, uh, cap A sub I, J. The cofactors are going to take care of the sign as well as the determinant of the matrix. So we can just write it as a summation of elements in A multiplied by their corresponding cofactors. And if you are doing an expansion about row I, you would fix that row I and do the summation for all J, for all columns, right? So you fix row I, right? In this case, I is fixed. And then you do the expansion for all the rows, uh, sorry, columns, J. And you would get that determinant. And similarly, if you want to do that expansion about any column J, then you are fixing column J and you are doing that summation over all the rows. So that would look like this. You see, column J is fixed. So column J is fixed, column J is fixed, and you are summing up with respect to I, all the rows. All the rows in that column, J. Um, but A sub I, J in both cases are entries in A, the original matrix, and the cofactors are also the same, right? A sub I, J is the signed determinant of the minor. A sub I, J, signed determinant of the minor. So everything is exactly the same here, but when you're doing the expansion about row I, you're summing up across the elements in that row for all columns. And if you are uh, doing the expansion with respect to column J, then you're fixing the column J and then you're su summing that across all the row in that column, all the row elements in that column. Okay, so you can simply write that as a summation in a compact form uh, like this. Elements with their cofactors. Next. Uh, let's try to do a selective cofactor expansion. Which one should I pick, right? So let's see if I do, if I, if I observe this particular matrix here, A is this matrix inside this, and you're trying to go for the determinant of the matrix. The first row has this particular zero. The second row has three zeros. Uh, third guy has um, two zeros. The fourth row doesn't have any zero. Uh, but I also like the, the, the last column here. Right, so row two or column four has three zeros. So I could do the expansion with respect to row two, or I could do the expansion uh, using uh, uh, using column four. Both of them are going to be sort of the easiest way to do it. Uh, let me pick this one. Let us expand. Oh, wait. Let us expand using row two. I could have picked column four as well. It has the three zeros there as well. So when you do with respect to row two, what do you have? There would be four things, right? Four multiplied by the cofactor, zero multiplied by the cofactor, zero multiplied by the cofactor, zero multiplied by the cofactor. All those things are already out. So what, what you're left with is only the first term, four, Take care of the sign, negative one raised to the row number plus the column number. For this four, it is going to be second row, first column. So two plus one there. And then the determinant of whatever remains when you remove this and remove this, right? So when you remove this guy and you remove this guy, what you have left is three, two, zero, three, zero, zero, seven, negative three, two. So all of that is written over here. And you're trying to go for the determinant of that particular minor. Now, when you have this, right, when you have this problem, you again can do the same thing. You can do be selective about how you do the cofactor expansion. Now, in the first row, I have one zero. In the second row, I have two zeros. So that's good. In the third row, I don't have. But so I, I could pick column three here or I could pick row two here. And let us pick column two here, uh, column three here. So when you pick column three, all of these things are scalar. So that will remain as is. Right, so this guy is going to be four multiplied by an odd multiple of negative one is simply going to give you negative four. Then because you are using this particular column here, let me highlight that as well uh, in blue, column three. 
So you got zero times something plus zero times something plus two times something. That only that last one will matter. So you have got two. You have to take care of the sign. So two is the third row, third column element. So you've got negative one raised to three plus three there. And then whatever remains. So if you remove this particular row, this particular column, you're left with this particular minor, three, two, three, zero, and you are going for the determinant of that minor. So you've got what? Now you can quickly simplify because determinant of uh, a two by two is simple enough to deal with. So you've got negative four multiplied by two, multiplied by plus one, and then uh, multiplied by uh, minus six. So you've got eight, negative eight times negative six, you've got a 48. Questions about this example? Triangular matrices, these are special matrices for which um, finding the determinant is very, very straightforward. So a triangular matrix is something that has zeros on the, uh, below the diagonal or above the diagonal. So for example, I can just uh, put a, a square matrix here and I will highlight the diagonal elements. These are my diagonal elements and they could be any arbitrary values. Uh, for an upper triangular matrix, you can have anything go here. Uh, for an upper triangular matrix, you can have anything that goes here, but you should have uh, zeros that go here. So this guy, the the below the diagonal you should have all zeros above the diagonal you should you can have anything if a matrix uh, satisfies this criteria then it would be called an upper triangular matrix and now you can see what, what the, a lower triangular matrix would look like Below the diagonal, you can have any elements, but above the diagonal, all zeros. So it, this would essentially switch. Uh, the, diag the diagonal elements can be anything, but what, what is above the diagonal and below the diagonal dictate whether it is triangular or not. If one of them is zeros, it would be triangular. And what, why are we doing this? We essentially are going for this because the cofactor is, expansion is going to be become very, very easy. Uh, because all you would need to do is what? You can expand using this last row here and then use this and then use this and then use this and then use this. Essentially what that will result in is essentially determinant of this matrix will be simply the product of all the elements that are in the diagonal. And you can take a matrix and do some manipulations to maybe get to a triangular matrix. So we're doing row manipulations. So let's just state these things uh, formally. If you have a choice, we would use the cofactor expansion about a row or column with lots of zero entries because the math would simplify very quickly there. So in the next section, what we look is uh, elementary row operations and how do they change the determinant of a matrix? We talked about the three operations, interchanging rows, multiplying by scalars uh, for a row or adding a multiple of one row to another, right? So these three row operations, how do they uh, affect the determinant of that matrix. But you're doing that to get more zeros. And if you are successful in getting all these zeros below the diagonal or above the diagonal, then you have a triangular matrix. Uh, so if a square matrix n by n is upper triangular, then its elements are zero when i is greater than j, which means the row number is greater than the column number, right? So this is the row number and this is the column number. So if you if you have i greater than j, all the elements are zero, then you are going to call that uh, an upper triangular matrix. Next, a lower triangular matrix, if it is uh, if you have elements that are zero, when i is less than j. So for all positions i is less than j, uh, you have, those elements are zero, 
then you have a lower triangular matrix. So for either one, upper triangular matrix or lower triangular matrix, the determinant of that matrix is simply going to be the product of all the elements in the diagonal. All you have to do is just multiply all the, pro all the elements in the diagonal. Because you see, if, if I go back to this example here, I can expand using uh, uh, the, the, the bottom most row here, which will essentially give me this guy and then multiplied by that cofactor. But I can do the same thing, expand using this. So I've got this multiplied by that cofactor, this multiplied by that cofactor and so on. At the end, it will simply result in multiplying all the uh, diagonal elements. So you have that. So if you, if you are able to get to a triangular matrix or you're given a triangular matrix, then finding the determinant of that matrix is very straightforward. Simply multiply the, the elements in the diagonal. Next, uh, let us try to uh, see relationships between determinant, singular values and eigenvalues. We have a couple of theorems here to state, which is A and B are two matrices of the same size. They are both square matrices and they're the same size n by n. Then the determinant of the product of the matrices A and B is the same as determinant of A multiplied by determ determinant of B. Uh, just be careful, you cannot do this for addition. So for example, determinant of A plus B is not determinant of A plus determinant of B, that doesn't hold but you can certainly do this for multiplication. So if you have the square matrices of the same size, the determinant of the product of those two matrices is the same as product of the determinant of each matrix. And um, the, the proof is sort of later uh, in uh, chapter six, uh, we'll, not, we'll not do the proof. Uh, the, another theorem, if A is an n by n matrix and is singular, right? If it is singular, then you know that the determinant of that matrix has to be a zero. It, it is an if and only if condition. So if A is singular, then the determinant of A is zero. It's not invertible. Now, what we saw earlier is that lambda is an eigenvalue of the matrix A if and only if A minus lambda I is singular. So what you're looking for is determinant of A minus lambda I goes to zero and you would find the corresponding eigenvalues lambda. So therefore lambda is an eigenvalue of A if and only if the determinant of A minus lambda I is a zero. A is the square matrix n by n, i is the identity matrix n by n, lambda is your scalar, your eigenvalue. So lambda, uh, right, so we'll look at this equation in more detail in, in a later section uh, in, in our next class. Let's try to look at a three by three example here. We have A, which is a three by three matrix. Uh, our question is, what are the eigenvalues of A? So you are looking for eigenvalues uh, and you do that by finding what? Determinant of A minus lambda I goes to zero. You would find what lambdas satisfy that. So you are given A as a three by three matrix. You would, you are, uh, this should not be determinant of A. This should be, uh, there's a typo there. This is determinant of A minus lambda I. Uh, and in this case, A is three by three. So this is A minus lambda I three. Uh, so if you did that, you see only the uh, diagonal elements are going to change because those are the only non-zero elements in the identity. And you're doing zero minus lambda, one minus lambda and one minus lambda. So only those three change, everything else is the same as A. Now, from this, you're trying to go for determinant of this matrix. And again, determinant of this matrix can be done with respect to any row, any column. And I hope you guys agree that uh, expanding it with respect to the last row over here is convenient. So we'll do this. Uh, zero times something, zero times something, only this one will remain. So one minus lambda multiplied by the sign, which is negative one, third row, third column. So three plus three there. And then the determinant of the minor. What is the minor for this guy? It is going to be over here. So you have over there. Uh, this is pretty simple now. One minus lambda carries over. Uh, you have got an even power of negative one. So that goes away. Uh, you have negative lambda multiplied by one minus lambda minus negative one times negative six. Simplify, factorize, you get these three factors for determinant of A minus lambda I. One minus lambda times lambda plus two times lambda plus three. What should that be? Well, we are trying to go for the eigenvalues. 
so determinant of a minus lambda i going to zero, right? So that's what we are trying to equal it to, goes to zero. So when you, now you have a cubic equation, right? Three roots, uh, we have already factored it. So what values of lambda would make it zero? You have three values, one, negative two, and, uh, and three, right? So those are your eigenvalues for this particular three by three matrix. Next, you can quickly check it. And the way you check it is take a, take a minus lambda i, check whether these are going to be sing singular or not. So essentially what you're checking for is, say we do it for lambda equals one, right? So when lambda equals one, you're saying uh, the way you check, say a determinant of a minus lambda i, is it equal to zero or not? And the, one of the solutions we got was uh, lambda is one. So you're saying, for lambda equals one, you say determinant of a minus i, does that go to zero or not? And you can say determinant of a is given to us minus i. So essentially that would be what? Determinant of the matrix uh, minus one there, this doesn't change, this doesn't change, negative six there, one minus one will give you a zero there, negative one, and then zero, zero, uh, and then the last one will be one minus one, which is a zero right? And clearly you can see the last row over here turned out to be a zero and right away you can say determinant is going to be zero, right? So it is singular. So we, we were able to quickly check uh, at least one value and you can plug in the other value as well, uh, the other two and to, to check whether these are a minus lambda i is singular or not. So finding eigenvalues of a three by three matrix. Earlier we did eigenvalues and eigenvectors for two by two cases. Next, uh, let us try to see uh, what the effect is on the determinant of a matrix when we do elementary row operations. Why would you ever want to do elementary row operations? Well, when I do elementary row operations, I can uh, make zeros, right? So I can, I can uh, manipulate my matrix by doing these row operations to have more zeros. And if I have more zeros, finding the determinant becomes very easy. So, uh, I don't, I cannot change uh, the, 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 the matrix itself. I have to have a row equivalent matrix. So I, I cannot change the solutions. So I will be doing row, row uh, um, manipulations only to, uh, to make my uh, determinant calculation simpler. There are three of them, right? So interchanging two rows keeps it row equivalent. Uh, rescaling a row keeps it row equivalent. Uh, adding a multiple of one row to another keeps it row equivalent. So these three uh, sort of strategies were adopted for the Gauss-Jordan elimination method to solve a system of linear equations. Our goal here is to find the effect on the determinant of a matrix if we interchange two rows, if we multiplied a row with a scalar, if we did this last particular uh, elementary row operation here. So we'll start with uh, the, the first one interchanging rows, but before that introduce zeros, right? That's the goal. The, the, the goal is to have as many zero entries as possible. And if you are able to get uh, a row or a column with all zeros, then you know the determinant is going to be zero. Uh, many terms uh, in the cofactor expansion are going to vanish if you have more zero entries in any particular row or column. So we are going to try to use the row operations to introduce more zero terms. That's the reason why we are doing it. So the calculation of the determinant becomes very straightforward. Next, how do you do elementary, how does the elementary row operation change the determinant? That's the thing that we are trying to find out. Next, um, whatever statements that you are going to make about rows, they are also going to hold the same for the columns, right? So we did, we said we are going to be doing row operations, but they also hold true for the columns. The reason being the determinant of A transpose is the same as determinant of A. So if you flip that matrix, the determinant doesn't change. Uh, if you transpose, if you interchange the rows in the columns of A, the determinant doesn't change. So all the things that we are going to say about the rows will also hold true for the columns. Um, we also have A, uh, if, if suppose we have A, uh, which has a row of zeros, then or columns, um, because we have already said this statement, determinant of that particular uh, matrix is going to be zero. So if you uh, have a situation where uh, a row 
before you did row operations or after you did row operations become becomes all zeros then determinant of that particular matrix is going to be a zero same applies for columns uh, let's try to check for the first one interchanging two rows what happens to the determinant of a matrix if uh, the rows in the matrix are interchanged and you're talking about interchanging one two rows just once so uh, if a is an n by n matrix b is obtained by swapping two rows of a right so b is a version of a but in which the uh, two rows have been swapped then the determinant of a is simply negative determinant of uh, negative uh, determinant of b is simply minus determinant of a interchanging two rows determinant gets flip of a sign uh, the two rows do not need to be adjacent they can be row two row five any row uh, let's do this with a, with an example here we have determinant and here we have a very simple two by two case the elements in this matrix are four negative three two and one the determinant of this guy is going to be four times one minus two times negative three so that will give you a ten if you interchange the two rows in this case there are only two rows so there's nothing more to interchange by just putting this guy here putting this guy here so you've got the second row becoming the first row and the first row becoming the second row here two one four negative three what is the uh, determinant here well you have two times negative three minus four times one which is going to give you negative 10. So that this quickly validates the statement. When you interchange rows, you multiply the determinant by a negative sign. Um, and you can see if you rechanged the rows, right, you change them back, then you multiply it with another negative sign. So you get back to the what you had originally. Uh, let's take a look at that corollary here. If A has two identical rows, then the determinant of A goes to zero. It's very easy to... Uh, well, actually, there are many ways of looking at it. One way of looking at it is, I said, if you interchange rows, the determinant should get multiplied by a negative sign. But if you had two identical rows, if you interchange the, 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 the rows, determinant of this new matrix is equal to negative determinants of the same matrix. So the only way you this can uh, satisfy if it is zero, right? So zero equals negative zero in that case. For all the other cases, is not going to satisfy. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is, if suppose you have a matrix with two identical rows and you did a particular row operation, say for example, you did row three minus row two, what would happen? Well, if there are two identical rows and you subtracted one from the other, all the elements in one of the rows is going to go to zero, right? So, and you expand with using the cofactor expansion with respect to that zero with all zeros, uh, you have... Uh, uh, determinant going to zero right so there are multiple ways of uh, sort of validating that if there are two identical rows the determinant of the matrix a is going to be a zero <clears throat> next rescaling a row what happens to the determinant of a matrix if you scale one of the rows in the matrix by some scalar a right so a is our n by n matrix b is our new matrix which is obtained by multiplying one row of a by some value c some arbitrary scalar c then determinant of the matrix b is going to be c times the determinant of the original matrix a uh, and we can prove this by looking at the expansion cofactor expansion determinant of b is simply uh, expanding it with any row any column right so we have we have we have we have looked at uh, this is some row right so we are doing the cofactor expansion about that particular row in B. Um, we have scaled each element of that row by C. So if you look at the new elements, they would be C times the old elements because we are doing the expansion about that same row, the row that got scaled by C, right? So all the elements in that row got scaled. So C times A sub IJ. But, but you also have the, the cofactors, corresponding cofactors. And you would sum up across all the columns because you are expanding about the row. Uh, now, C is a scalar, so you can pull it out of the summation. And what you're left with is C times the uh, determinant of A. So this quickly checks what happens. Uh, th this proves uh, what happens when you multiply one row of A, not all the elements, just one row of A by uh, C you'd multiply the determinant by that same C. So let's take an example here. You have a determinant of this matrix. Uh, the matrix is two by two. 
uh, this is the same matrix as before. Uh, the determinant of this guy is going to be 4 plus 6. So that will give you 10. What happens when you multiply row 2 by 5? So if you multiply row 2 by 5, you get 10 here and 5 there. Find the determinant of this guy. It's going to be 50. That is 5 times the determinant of the original matrix. So multiplying a row by a scalar multiplies the determinant by that same scalar. Interchanging flips the sign of the determinant. Uh, so we are just uh, talking about the general case here. Scaling the matrix, the, scaling the entire matrix, not just one row, all the rows, right? So if you, if you uh, scale A, every element in A by some C, right? So A is an n by n matrix and B is obtained by scaling all the entries in A by C, which essentially says, which essentially means B is a matrix which is obtained by multiplying A matrix by scalar C. Then what you have is determinant of this new matrix B is going to be C raised to N determinant of A. So if you, if you think about uh, one of those uh, rows with respect to which you are doing the cofactor, cofactor expansion, you have got C times uh, whatever remains, C times whatever remains, C times whatever remains, and you are doing that for n rows. So what we have is scaled n rows in A, which essentially means that you are multiplying it by C to the n. Next, uh, add a multiple of one row to another, right? Um, you would expect determinant to change in this case because you're taking one row you're multiplying with some scalar and adding it to another row but you will see that determinant of uh, b will be the same as determinant of a you don't change the determinant if you take a row multiply it with some scalar and add it to another row uh, you change it when you multiply with the scalar but you add it to another row you don't change it you don't change the determinant so let A be an n by n matrix. There is a matrix B which is obtained by adding a multiple of one row of A to another row. Then determinant of B is going to be the same as determinant of A. So the example over here is determinant of this particular matrix here 2 by 2 is 10. If I added 3 copies of row 2 to row 1, what do I get? Well, 3 copies of row 2 I have added to row 1. So row 1 has changed to 10 and 0. The row 2 has remained the same. The determinant of this guy is also 10. The determinant hasn't changed. Even though I did this particular row operation, which is uh, 3 times row 2 uh, plus row 1. Uh, actually, I did row 1 plus 3 times row 2. Right. Didn't change. All right, next, let's try to find the determinant of a four by four matrix. And we will try to use row reductions to make our uh, finding determinant easy. We will try to see, we will try to introduce zeros. So what we have is determinant of A, A is given to us and we are trying to find the determinant of this guy. Uh, what we can do is uh, we could directly go for this particular um, uh, row here, expand it with this particular row, and then uh, you would be left with three by three matrices. But there's an easier way to deal with this by transitioning A to a, a triangular matrix. For this particular A, it works. Let's try to take a look. Um, do these row operations. Row three minus two times row one, row four plus three times row one. If you do these row operations, you get this particular matrix here and you're still trying to find the uh, determinant of that. But these operations, we know both of them, they do not change the determinant. So I can say this is no change in determinant. which is why determinant of this guy is going to be the same as this guy. I didn't do any manipulation there. Now, once I 
I have zeros here, right? So I, I have, I made these row operations in such a way that I get a zero there, there and a zero there. I have that now. Uh, I already have these two as zeros. So if I was able to make these two guys zeros, I would have a uh, upper triangular matrix. So instead of making these two guys zeros, what I can do is I can simply swap this row and this row. So if you swap row two and row four, we know that that changes the determinant. You get a negative sign there. You get, uh, you get, you, you need to multiply with a negative sign there. Um, but you can swap the rows. Now, once you swap the rows, what do you have? You have a triangular matrix. Below the diagonal, everything is a zero. For that uh, matrix, the determinant is obtained by simply multiplying all the elements in the diagonal. So you've got one times five times negative four times negative uh, times three and the negative sign carries over because of the swapping of the two rows. And you get a 60 in this case. So you can do the row operations. Uh, you just have to keep track of whether you are interchanging rows or not, and whether you are multiplying a row with a scalar or not. Doing the row operations such as row three minus two times row one, that is not going to change the determinant. And if you are able to get to a triangular matrix, then you are essentially multiplying the elements in the diagonal to uh, get to the determinant. All right, uh, that is all I had for you guys for today. I will stop recording. Uh, stop sharing, stop.